Okay, hello everyone. Hi. So I am Yu Tingjie, and here we have Huang Xiangyun and Emma Dusong for this artist talk panel two for the exhibition "When Islands Dream," uh, exhibiting at Mocha State Taipei right now. So before we jump in to ask Emma and Xiangyun to introduce their works, I like to have a brief, very brief introduction of the exhibition. And so let me share my screen. Um, can you see my screen right now? Not yet. Is it showing? No. Wait. Um, oh, let me try again. Here, yeah, yeah, it's working. Yeah, right? Okay. So, um, the exhibition and uh, called "When Islands Dream." So there can be multiple implications of the islands, but mostly it is about Mazu Island. Mazu Islands is an an archipelago ruled by Chinese government, or more formally, it is called Republic of China. ROC. It is situated at the front line of cross strait conflicts between before the Cold War ended, and it has been at the military front line since 1949. And you can see on the Google map that it is closer to China than to Taiwan. So because of this, it experienced longer and harsher military law periods than Taiwan Island itself, like uh, people there were forbidden to travel to Taiwan or other islands and or they with other restrictions in their daily life. Yet, despite they were mobilized and restricted as part of the the troops on the islands, there were named never an actual battle that had taken place on the land of Mazu. Thus this past that of uh, the restriction, the repression and human rights violations remain pretty much on silence as like no evident incidents to be marked in history. And soon after the martial law was lifted, Madu was soon promoted as a relaxing traveling destination, exoticized and fantasized by tourists. Living the past history, a lot of them were untouched or forgotten. Like you can see, the former military tunnel would turn into a tourist spot for people to, to play with. And this, therefore, the exhibition aims to explore the inner sides of Mazu from within and from the outside. And it has been a collaborative project of artists and the community members. And the exhibition got inspiration from the streaming ceremony in Beigan. Every lunar uh, January 29th, there were people flooding to a very small local temple to ask deities via dreaming. So they write down their questions and then they try to fall asleep and hopefully the deities will give them answers in their dream. And if someone cannot go in person or they have trouble falling asleep themselves, they can even ask another person to dream for them. And these ideas, and the idea of dreaming actually coincides when we think about um, discuss discussion in trauma theories that dreams can reveal the unrecognizable wounds or the unintelligent memories. So dream is a way to bridge reality and fantasy and also the connecting past and futures. Therefore, I, as a curator, I thought that it might be a way to combine the historical context and with the background of psychological theories. And I, I was thinking if it was possible to approach the unspeakable past of Mazu through dreams. And as I said before, that they were um, substitute dreamers that can help others to dream. And would an artist be the ideal 
uh, candidate for this kind of substitute dreamers. Therefore, I invite five artists uh, to come to the island. And Xiang Yun and Emma are two of them. So now I would like to welcome Emma to start first talking about her art practices and how she got interested in these projects and what she had made for this exhibition. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for attending and thank you to the MOCA team for inviting me. So I'm gonna start talking about my work in the past and how I started and how I've got I've got an interest in uh, in the voice in my work and then um, I'll finish with uh, the the piece I'm showing in uh, in the museum of uh, Mocha. So I'll share my screen and uh, show you a few images. Here you go. Yeah, this is working. Okay, so my name is Emma and my last name is Dusson. And uh, a lot of times people ask me if that's my real last name because son in French means sound. And I find it interesting also that when you write it down, it's, it's written like a song in English. So I guess I was, uh, I, I had to sing at some point in my life, but uh, at first it was something that was really scary to me. Like I had never um, sang and, uh, and I was very, um, I was very, I'm just going to put the, the time. Yeah. I was very scared about it. Uh, I felt like if I was going to sing, I would fall down, like my voice would sort of fall down. I felt like uh, if I'm talking, my voice is very like la 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 la. But if I'm if I'm singing, it sort of takes, um, it, it sort of flies. And so I might fall down. So this was really, really scary. And um, I started in the 90s making videos. I started really young at 15. And, uh, and really soon I had shows at 17, uh, my films were shown in festivals. So there was a point that I thought, okay, I have to start doing something that really scares me. And singing was like super scary. So I started singing and at first I did performances and I felt like I really wanted to be with the public and not have a distance with them. So here I'm in my school, uh, Les Beaux-Arts uh, in Paris. And I'm among the public and I'm singing songs a cappella because I felt that there was a lot of strength in the idea of singing a cappella, but also a lot of vulner vulnerability. So, and uh, I wrote and composed my own songs, which were very simple songs that sounded a little bit like lullabies. And then I thought, okay, how do I do this if I want to show my work in a, an exhibition space? And this was really interesting to me to think about how a time-based medium could be shown in a space where people could actually move and uh, it wouldn't be just a spectator, but it would be like a visitor. So I've started doing triggers. Uh, it's performances that starts uh, a piece. So in that piece, it's called Suitcase. I'm carrying a suitcase and I'm singing. Um, at first I was composing in English and French, but at some point I thought it would be interesting to sing in other languages, uh, to have a more like a universal approach, but also to find new uh, new melodies. So I'm singing, Hirave, Hirave, Mi Vachnara, Mi Vachnara, Kasha Kasiram, Ayo Hirave, Bidi Artam. So I'm singing in Armenian. I asked a friend of mine, Maral Keropian, to translate it in Armenian. And when I put down the suitcase, the suitcase starts singing. And it's like a, it's like a breath. I feel like uh, singing is an extension of breathing. It's very much alive, which was really interesting to me um, as a medium. And here the suitcase opens up and starts singing like while opening up. And I also wanted the speakers to become some sort, some sorts of uh, eyes that would look at you. This business uh, is a bit about, um, 
I mean, all my pieces are very opened, but uh, to me, it was the idea of uh, how do you build yourself? What do you carry on in your suitcase? It's your story, it's your life, it's your experiences, your trauma, your joy. And all of this is going with you where you're going. But also, um, there was the idea that you're not stuck with your story. Like if you've gone through something really difficult, you can actually move on. You can, of course, it's going to be heavy and it's going to be in your hand and you're going to carry it with you, but uh, you can also move. So there was really the idea of mobility and also the story and your bag baggage and luggage and um, and your experiences are accompanying you uh, with a song. So, so to me, it was, uh, yeah, the idea of mobility and, and constructing yourself. And, and then I, I really wanted a piece that would be more like a, an installation, like a piece where people could actually go through. So this is a piece called Classroom. It's from 2012. And in this piece, I'm going to show you an extract uh, of the piece. Can we hear the sound? Not yet. Yeah, good. Um, we cannot hear the sound? No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll put this on louder so you can hear it better. So what I'm saying is when I think, when I think, I have more questions than answers. And when I have more answers than questions, maybe I'll be ready to die. Maybe I'll be ready to die. And so this is a trigger where I'm singing and I'm, I'm playing a hand game. It's a, it's a hand game we play in France and I'm sure in a lot of countries where you have to take your, your hands off before the, the, the other person slaps you. And I'm playing a hand game with that uh, school desk. And the idea was also that um, uh, the to question the relation with knowledge. And so this is the trigger. And soon after, I do. Um, Yes, uh, after I sing, the school desk sings by itself. So the installation, um, oops, the installation were like many school desks, like uh, suggesting a classroom, and each of the school desks were opened, but uh, at a different level, with the idea that it could be, um, that could be a song, like a freeze frame on a, on a, on some, on the school desk moving, and. Uh, each text could have its own song with its own pupil. And, and on my school desk, it was the idea of questioning uh, how do you approach life? Like uh, questions are really part of my work and the idea that, uh, that it, it can really help you on approaching life. Um, and it was, uh, of course, we can see the idea of uh, the relation with within 
the classroom, between the teacher and the students. But to me, it was also the idea of um, questioning a relation to, to knowledge in general. Like, if you want to know what's going on in the world, it's possible. But if you really want to know what's going on, then it might be dangerous. So it's the idea of you really want to know, you really want to to touch the knowledge that is like um, in the school desk. But at the same time, you have to sort of uh, negotiate with uh, abuse and authority and how to get the knowledge. So it's really a piece about freedom. So although it's very dreamlike, it's also quite political. This is a piece called Robin uh, from 2016. It's part of a collection of Musée Gassendi and it was also shown uh, at the Centre Pompidou in, pa in Paris. It's a piece where, um, where I wanted to question uh, what is not there anymore, uh, the, disappear the disappearance. Um, I really thought that by choosing the medium um, of, like by choosing voice as a medium, I really thought, oh, this is going to be very much alive. And I really thought that it would be, of course, a very sens sensory experience, give a very sensory experience, and um, and that it would be very physical. But really, the idea of something very alive really interested me. And because it's very much alive, it's also very much about dis disappearance. Like if you think about it, if you have a voice, a voice is there and it's simultaneously uh, living, which um, it's like uh, disappearing. It's there and disappearing at the same time. Uh, it's very ephemeral. I mean, it's very much, it's just like life, you know? Um, so it actually made sense that there's there's a lot of uh, spectrality in my work um, because uh, because how do you make a voice last, you know, when it's gone? So I'll show you an extract of this piece. It's a video that is very projected very widely to to have a, like uh, I really tried I really tried to have it uh, quite hypnotic. And I'll show you the end. It's a loop. So it's called Robin because the place is called Bagda. Uh, it's um it's a place in uh, Dean Le Bain. It's a very um. Uh, it's really an amazing place. It really looks like the moon. And when I saw it, I was like, I really have to do a piece there. Um, it's a place where the sea uh, was. It, it was the sea was there a very long time ago, and it disappeared. So what I tried to do was to bring back the sea with um, with my vocal. And so I thought I would do a Ooh. so like something quite flat with the idea of uh, of the the sea coming back so this is uh another piece called AO from 2018 AO is a piece i did uh in um in a house by uh, Auntie Lovag uh it's a house called uh, Maison Bernard in the south of France in Teul sur mer near Cannes and it's a very special house everything's completely round and it, it's very organic it feels amazing to live there I stayed there uh, for two years to uh, to make uh, that that piece and um, and there's a piece that is an in-situ piece so it's a it's a it's a piece that is actually there and I also did a video so um at first i thought okay um i'll bring an object i'll i'll have something maybe in the garden 
And then I realized that the house was so alive in itself that I could actually um, have it part of the, the piece. And, um, and so, so the house, um, what I did is that I composed the song for the house. So now the house sings every day at five in the afternoon. And, uh, and the song is uh, very much about uh, trust. It's uh, the house in itself is like two arms. It really feels like two arms like that in front of the sea. And it's really a feeling of, of being, uh, it's very tactile and it's very, um, uh, you really feel like you're in the arms of someone or of the house in it, in this, in that case. And, and it's a very quite fragile house that needs protection from its inhabitants, but it's also a house that really feels like it's protecting you. So I wanted in the song to have this reciprocal uh, situation relationship between the inhabitants and the um, and the um, and the house i'll show you extracts of the um, video that i did it's uh, three extracts So, so yeah, this was very a very positive work uh, for for me. Um, I usually work on the idea of uh, of the relationship with uh, authority abuse, like how do you deal with the situation and how do you negotiate your freedom? And in that piece, um, and nothing is going to slap you or like. Uh, Nothing is going to hurt you. It's really a piece about trust and being together. And it's called AO. AO A means and and O. Oh, it's the 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 letter O. Um, because O in French also means water. Uh, and uh, around the house there's uh there's a swimming pool and in front of the house there's the sea. And O is also the same shape of um as the shape of the the house that is very round, and um, and it was also something that I wanted it uh, I wanted this uh, O to punctuate the song, so you wouldn't get the the lyrics right away. <clears throat> so like um, so like because it was for people who actually lived there, I wanted them to to. Uh, to have their relationship with the the song of the house to grow with time 
and to understand more and more what I meant uh, by this song. And so it's um, in the lyrics I'm saying that in, in your arms I turn, I, I face in my arms, you turn, you face, and it's like a, a, a loop like that. And um, so the video, it shows the, the trigger of, the, of the, the piece, which I did during the inauguration of the piece. And now, so the house sings every day at five, like I said before. So it's really a piece about being together um, and getting and having power being together. Um, so I also wanted to share a, a few, um, like a few pieces with the idea of questions, like we've seen before in classroom, there's the idea of questions. I've started writing my questions in 2008. So I always carry on my, like a, a little notebook and I write my questions every day. And so I, I have a lot of uh, notebooks with questions. And in that piece, I'm showing uh, one of them um, under under plexiglass, so you cannot actually touch it. And uh, and it's called uh, the notebook with the um, invisible questions. This is another one. And this is a piece I did last year. It's uh, an engraving. Um, I did a series of pieces, mostly video installations in um in a village called uh, Chova in uh, Spain. And I asked uh, the people from the village to tell me what were their questions and they wrote it down. And so these are like the rooftops of, um, of the village and from the roof rooftops raises um, the, the question of each one. So this one says, uh, what will it be like after and what will the world be like and this one says how come we had a good water before and now we have bad water um so i've i've made uh there a series of uh, video installation with the people and so um that was my first experience with the fact that i wasn't singing myself and that i was asking someone else to sing which was uh, important to me um I've done many, many pieces with other people in the past, but um, I had never done a piece where it was on me singing. Um, only one time in Brazil, I did a performance once, and uh, and the second time I asked someone else to do the performance for me, which was, uh, I wanted to see if that was important that it would be me singing and if it could be someone else. And, um, and then I realized that uh, if I write it for myself, it has to be me who sings it. But if I write it for someone else, then it makes sense. If I write a song for someone else, then it makes sense that it's someone else uh, singing it. And, um, and it could be like two different things. And it was really important uh, to me in the past year to um, see what it would be like to have other people sing. and. Um, yeah, because this idea of collective uh, has been really part of my work in the past when I was doing documentaries. So I wanted to to have that again. And we arrive at Mechionu. So it's called Facing You in uh, in English. The title to me, I wanted I wanted the title to be quite opened. The you can be anything. Um but there's definitely the idea of facing. So there are three matrices uh, rising up like monolith. And um, to tell you about how I did this. Well, first of all, um, when Yu Ting contacted me with this project, I was so excited because uh, I really felt like the core of my work was understood because of course there's the idea of uh, dream dreams in my work. There's the idea of questions in my work, and um, and definitely there's the idea of engagement. So it was the first time that a creator actually had understood that that situation in my work um, and uh, how it was intertwined 
and how it could, um, yeah, uh, the the project was uh, completely made sense with my work, and um, and I guess I, my art really questions freedom and how to be free, and singing is a tool to face adversity. So, um, so making an art piece on the history of the Matsu Islands throughout the prism of the dream ceremony really made sense to me. And so I, I definitely felt really close to the, the theme of the exhibition, although I had never been to the Matsu Islands and I had never been to Taiwan either. So there was a contrast between proximity um, and distance. And it continued throughout the process of making the piece. Because of the pandemic, I soon realized I could not, I would not be able to come to the Matsu Islands. So I would have to do everything from abroad. And at first I was very reluctant to this idea. I thought it, uh, I thought it wouldn't work. Um, I mean, there's definitely the idea of presence in my work, uh, of co-presence, of being together. So I wasn't sure it, um, it would be fine, you know. Um, for, for example, for my performances, I like to perform with the public and not in front of them. And I sing back the energy that the audience gives me. And, um, and to, together we create new energy. And this is really, although a lot of times in my performances I'm by myself, it's, it has this very collective uh, situation uh, energy. So um, because it was a story that um, that uh, that were like uh, from the Matsu Islands, I really felt like with that piece, it was obvious that uh, that I should work with people from there, um, and that people from the islands had to be involved. So I thought, okay, when I film someone uh, or when I record someone within the space we share, we exchange energy, we build trust, and I, this is something I've been writing about in the past. Um, I really feel like we, we have like a, a relationship, uh, a three-way uh, relationship. What I mean by, is that, by that is that as a filmmaker, um, I'm feeling the person, I, I'm filming the person and um, the person that is being filmed is there's a duo, but there's also um, a three-way relationship because the viewer is also there. And so, um, so yeah, we're always three people, but if I'm far away, how would that work? You know, I, it, it brought a lot of questions, this, uh, this idea of doing the piece uh, remotely. So um, also I use, um, I use um, a technique, it's not really a technique, but uh, uh, called haptonomy um, to anchor in the space and uh, it really helps with the, the feeling of being together and of being alive and so I wasn't sure how I would do this with the performers and um, so there was really a, a situation of trust. I had to trust that through my instructions and our past conversations this uh, situation would naturally occur during um, during the shooting. And also I thought, how am I going to make a piece about something that is so historic and so local, so like about the Matsu Islands, if I'm not there? Because usually when I go to a place, I soak up the local energy, I open all my senses and this reappear in the art piece. And uh, I thought how, I mean, none of this is going to be possible if I'm staying in Europe behind my computer. So I thought, okay, so I'm not able to go to the Matsu Islands. So maybe it shouldn't be, the piece shouldn't be about the Matsu Islands exactly, but it might, it could be, um, it could be built uh, and, um, yeah, it could be built on the idea of uh, the geographical space between the islands and where I stayed. And so distance in itself 
became the space. And um, I thought uh, this space ideal for projections uh, could take on meaning with the idea of dreams and question, which is also the idea of um, projections. And a question is also a call seeking a listening. And the piece could be enriched by its long distance relationship throughout calls, emails, exchanges, implying always remoteness. Um, so we did write a lot of emails. Uh, I looked it up the other day and I realized we exchanged more than 500 emails, which is uh, a lot um, for uh, a group show. And uh, there was a lot of uh, translations in different languages and dialects. So I was really excited about that because languages has been so much part of my work. So I first wrote a letter in English to introduce my project to the inhabitants uh, of Matsu, as well as my work. And you know, English is a language I learned uh, when I was an exchange student in, um, in the United States when I was 15. So it's a language that I'm very familiar with. And uh, in the email I wrote, singing is an act of resistance. It allows us to express what cannot be said out loud yet. And I asked the people from Atsu what were their questions with that dimension of um, resistance. And uh, Yu Ting translated it in Mandarin, and she found three Matsu residents who were interested in participating. So I'm going to say their names. Uh, the accent might be terrible. Cheng Chao Ying, Li Yu Meiyu, and Li Yu Hangwen. And we all talked together about the islands, their past, their present, and also their perspectives on the future of Matsu. And then I wrote the lyrics of the song in English. And Yu Ting translated it in Mandarin. And Li Yu Hangwen and Huang Kai Yang translated it in the Matsu dialect. So because it was a very plural, um, vocal piece. It was my first pro vocal piece, actually. I decided to compose with the piano. I usually compose just um, just with my voice. I don't use any other instruments. But this time, I thought uh, it would really help if we had a bass with piano that we could all follow. So I guess this was the final translation from Matsu language to music. And I tried to make it, make it as easy as I could for non-professional singers to sing it. So it begins with a repeated meishonu. So it's like meishonu, meishonu, meishonu. And I really wanted some like a like a beginning that hits the ground as a way to ground oneself in front of adversity. And then the song progresses slowly using each musical phrase to build the next one. And the melody rises toward a dreamlike state to return to a rooted place to end on a higher note on the verb say, which means be. So I wanted it to be a cappella so the voice wouldn't rest on anything. This is like very much about strength, but also about vulnerability. And during the shooting, I asked the performers to close their eyes and dream about their questions. And it became an art performance in itself to ask one's, one's questions, seeing dream in one single uh, sequence. And because the technical crew had to send me each take to watch, the shoot took double time it usually takes. Adding the time difference, it was quite a challenge for everyone. So I would really like to to thank everyone who was involved in this project because uh, and during the shooting because it was very, um, yeah, it was quite intense. So in the installation, the, singer, the singers float on mattresses and rise like monolith to form a triptych. I'll show you another. Um, after asking the question, they sing a cappella one at a time and the other two reappear showing how song has the power to call out others and create collective energy. While they sleep, 
I sing on the French side of the Mediterranean Sea, responding to the voices coming from the Matsu Sea. The song from the Matsu Islands become a call that echoes abroad, and the space between us is figured by the sea. The inhabitants of Matsu are placed in the center of the piece, and as a foreigner, I appear from a distance. So to me, this piece really suggests that we can face our fears by dreaming and questioning. And of course, everyone, anyone is free to explore the history of the Matsu Islands, their past, their present, and their possible future. The questions asked in the piece are quite contextual, but in the lyrics, um, we understand that the inhabitants have a, are facing a threat, but this threat remains open to projections um, of each of their own fears. So with this piece, I hope to raise questions to the viewer. How do you face your fears? How do you face threats? Um, and I know there is um, there's definitely uh, no like uh, one single solution, but my piece is here to intend to rise up, to rise each one of us from fear and immobility throughout proximity with our questions and also with distance with our dreams. Really quick, uh, I wanted to say that on a side note, beds have been part of my work for a long time. In this piece, I'm trying to fight back something invisible on the beds, the bed racks. And in that piece, uh, I'm holding, and uh, anyone, any visitor can hold um, pillows that are talking pillows that, uh, that describe a voice of someone who uh, was not there anymore, who has died. And so I guess in the past, um, beds have been suggested, uh, beds have been a place of danger and mourning, but in Mechionu, they now stand up. Um, I want to say that uh, I, was, I don't know what went through the performance heads when they each said their questions and sang, but to me, they expressed different emotions and perspectives going from anger um, to poetic playfulness, passing by worry, and to show their individuality, I wanted to each of them have their own sequence. And at some point in my echo, somewhere in the French side of the Mediterranean Sea, we unite and sing together, make your new. Before I play the, the video, I want to say again that this was a team effort. Um, so thank you to everyone involved. Um, it's a piece that uh, will definitely require a second for me. I feel like I really have to go at some point to the Matsu Islands and after that trip to make uh, another piece uh, to see how it would be different uh, to, to, to have a, a perspective from there and not from the distance. So I'll show you uh, the video and, and I'll be done. Is this better like that? Mama, you made it. We should have made a long thing.
Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you for your presentation. And uh, this has been really um, interesting to know, like from throughout your process, uh, the, uh, the timeline of your artistic practice to know what have for like influenced you to make this work. So you can see pieces and elements from your previous pro projects about like the elements of that and about the questioning and also how you uh, use voices to evoke uh, emotions and feelings. So um, we can leave, uh, discuss more afterwards. And now I would like to welcome Xiang Yun to share her work. Okay. I'm sharing my screen now. Did you see the PowerPoint? Okay. So uh, my my work in this uh, exhibition is a, a workshop. Uh, it's called Memory Punctum and Photography and Cartography Workshop. And um, yeah, so in the first part, I, I would like to share why does the curator invite me. And um, my background uh, is in philosophy. And later in 2015, I went to the Netherlands to study a master in contemporary art theory, uh, where my thesis was about uh, moving image and philosophy of time. So uh, I think theories are really important part of my work. And yeah, and I start to make films and video after I graduate. And uh, most of the film and videos I made are uh, based on poems I wrote. And the, usually the theme is about mornings, dream and death and love, like sort of the about life itself or it's some intimate relationship that I had before. And apart from like uh, 
researcher and making films. Uh, I have been doing art education for, for many years. So I designed lots of uh, workshops during the art education section I lead. So I, I see myself more like a, a teaching artist because uh, I don't like to provide knowledge in a one directional method. So uh, because I really don't like to listen to lecture that has like a binary between teachers and students or like uh, authorities and receivers. So I was always trying to uh, design some kind of method or a game or some involving some uh, board game to the uh, participant. So because I want to encourage the participants to put their own exciting knowledge, worldview, or their creativity into the framework uh, I create. So, so to more precisely, I focus on methods for participants to share their stories and feelings in order to form multiple uh, storylines. So uh, I translate lots of art history movement or philosophy into games uh, that lead uh, participants to, to join. And I think it's only through this form of engagement that one can create their own sort of artworks instead of uh, memorizing or mimicking the art history knowledge because it's really common in Taiwan that because we have this entrance exam uh, for getting into high school and bachelor and the way that the exam trained us to learn things are memorizing stuff and uh, without like uh, any training argument, we just uh, click like some uh, uh, choose options and memorize things. So uh, we really, uh, I think, have some problems uh, to into like learning our argumentation or more creative knowledge in Taiwan, I think, because of the entrance exam. And so one of the workshop uh, I designed is called Creating Dreamscape. It was a workshop about surrealism with a focus on poetry and uh, photo collage. So uh, Tammy attended that uh, workshop. So, and also the theme is about dream. So I guess that's why she invited me to this exhibition. And there are three parts of the workshop. The, the first one is like I use for a game to lead the participant to tell about each other's the dreams that they had before. And the second part uh, are like a blindfolded games because surrealisms like to get inspiration from everyday objects, um, but it's a bit difficult for uh, for some people to like uh, do free association or reconnect with everyday objects. So I decide to let them be blindfolded. So after the participants uh, are blindfolded, they can uh, touch different objects. And then uh, through touching these objects, they can start to uh, remember their childhood memory. So I ask them to try to remember their childhood memory when they are being blindfolded and touch all this everyday object like umbrella or cups. And then afterwards, uh, they write down what they feel and what they memorize and then make a, a collage of the photos and the DM and the papers they brought to the workshops. And and I sort of also play some uh, poetry game, like Exquisite Corpse game, that turned the text into poems and uh, photo collages. And these are some of the examples that the participants made. Okay, so this was my uh, previous workshop about surrealism. And when I went to Mud, uh, I designed another workshop. It's called Memory Punctum Photography and Cartography Workshop. And when I went to Mazin, I heard about this uh, dreaming ceremony. I think it's really interesting and really like fascinating, but I don't think that uh, my previous workshop uh, is relevant because it's a whole different context. 
and uh, I think the surrealism is not relevant to Mazu's like specific historical and cultural context because uh, if you research a bit you can see that it's not about like Freudian psychoanalysis or going into your subconscious uh, and try to know your repressive desire in your mind. Uh, as far as I understand, the dreaming ceremony is more related to this uh, Chinese uh, culture phenomenon of how uh, local people who desire to know what will happen in the future come to the temples. So it's a way to release like everyday life anxieties or to find comfort uh, to to give a wish or give a hope to find comfort in your uncertain futures one is facing. So, and then the dream, the role of dream in this ceremony is like a medium between the people and the deities and an interpreter will help you to interpret like uh, your, your dream. So I think it's not really at all related to surrealism and subconscious uh, in in this uh, European context. Um, so I I was uh, I thought okay it's not working at all. So so I read a lot of documents about history and geography of Mazu, but I still think I cannot handle the really specific history and anthropology aspect of the Mazu because I, I never went to Mazu until this time as well. And I think it's really different. And I don't, also I'm from Taiwan, but actually I don't have the enough uh, knowledge, but I think it's also a bit of this uh, phenomenon of cultural imperialism in Taiwan and my education background that actually I, I know more theory from Europe uh, than Taiwan and my whole background in uh, in philosophy and then I was studying Europe so actually I have really need little knowledge about my own like country like I think I have less uh, knowledge of course I have everyday knowledge or, or default knowledge about Taiwan but not this kind of all the theories I've been involved in so so I decide to focus on my sensation and feelings more, although I, I still uh, had inspired by some uh, theory from France again that I will explain later. But uh, I started to recall like when I was uh, doing field trip in Mazu, what was the most uh, like strong things in my body, like the feeling that uh, struck me. And I think uh, one of the things that makes me more uh, strong is the there are lots of spikes around the island. Like this is a photo I took. It was the other artist when they were <clears throat> making the videos. And you can see on this uh, photo <clears throat> on the seat, there are these uh, spikes that was like for military purpose, for anti like people to landing on the island. So these are all like uh, for preventing the possible war that never happened on the island. It happened on the sea, but not not on the territory of the land uh, island before. And then you can also see uh, these kind of plants. It's called sisal hemp, and it's also like not from Monzo, but it's there are a lot of these plants for for military purpose as well, and even. Uh, when you go underneath the tunnels, tunnels, of course, is also military purpose. You can also see these sound suppressors and uh, it's also in the shape of spikes. So I was starting to interested in how I can um, design a workshop about the landscape and about the skypes, uh, spikes on, on the island. So... I was thinking like, uh, what are the inhabitants' feelings about the landscape of spikes and what are their landscape identities and their memory of landscape uh, in general? So, so I took 
uh, I try to, some of the activities in these new workshops are actually the same, but I give them a new context and different purpose. Okay, so the uh, first is like, I was thinking of how to sort of collect all their memories uh, and emor emotion of the landscape with maps or with some kind of games. And I was like reading Sky Dibor's psychogeography. And then I think, okay, maybe I can uh, sort of share this concept to the inhabitants and design some games. So the first activity is like I invited the local participant to collect stones from the place that bore meanings to them. So, and then they brought to this workshop like here, and then uh, they put the stones on the location. So I used a rope on the floor and is the border of Mazu. And then they put the stones uh, like where they collected and share why, uh, what's the special meanings, they, their relationship with the stones. And I think I, I, ch I chose stone because stones are not just metaphors for landscape, but actually is literally part of the landscape. And afterwards, they, they form a circle and uh, I ask them to sort of do a post uh, with the stone they collect and with this, all the spikes I collect uh, in, the, in the middle. And then so everyone uh, ha has to do a post with this thing, with the spike and the stone, and they cannot uh, repeat to the previous person. And some participants mentioned that they want to rebuild the house because their home was torn down. And the participant preserved the precious relics uh, and to uh, reserve, preserve uh, at her home. And one person was sharing that uh, he was almost drowned during one seaside. So she, he went to that seaside again and brought that stone to come to the workshop. And then one other participant, uh, he was uh, finding some stone on the seaside to pound garlic. And uh, yeah, I don't have that uh, picture because I take effort because he's actually using it every day in the kitchen. So. Uh, so actually, l m most of the participants, they, they really have uh, some stones that have special meanings for them. I think it has to do with that Mazu is an island. It's always really easily to be accessed to the seaside. And there are so many different kinds of stones and different textures and their landscapes are really like consists of these stones. And the other uh, participant, uh, she was not from Mazu, like, uh, and then she, when she came here more as a tourist, she was a bit afraid of this, like, military landscape. Like, uh, she picked the stone from Iron Fort, is Tie Bao in uh, Mazu in Chinese, and because she can see lots of spikes and the police and then so when she mm, explained the story of the song she's more expressing like uh, her fear about police and the idea of military in the island so uh through a stone i think you can really see the memories of local people and theories and how they rely relate to the landscape and the second uh, activity is an exercising using blindfolds again. Um, but this time uh, I didn't ask them to like recall their childhood memory. I just uh, asked them try to memory all the landscapes in Matsu. And uh, because the workshop was held above a tunnel, uh, it's a hostel now, but it was military. Uh, architecture before so underneath there's a tunnel uh, and then and I asked the participants to also blindfold it and to touch and feel the texture of the landscape of the tunnel which is also a kind of stones but it's just larger and I'm going to show you the a video about the game 
of being blindfolded. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I will have to say the copyright of this uh, video. Can uh, Anne play them? Okay. Yeah, this video, yeah, is from the National Art and Culture Foundation that they, they help us film. the same uh, person from the Emma's video. Okay, I will go back to my PowerPoint. So you can see there, uh, there were like blindfolded and then went into this uh, tunnel. And there are lots of sound also when I'm, when I'm doing this. So there were like sound of winds and waves and some like artillery shells sound when they were moving. So actually they, there are lots of different feelings uh, that the participant shares afterward. So afterwards, I ask them to write down all the feelings or all the memories they have about landscapes or just any kind of feelings they have during the blindfolded or any feelings they, they start to recall when they are doing the previous two exercises. So it's sort of like some ways to collect their emotions and memories about the landscape. So they write it on this card you can see on the PowerPoint. And then I also give them lots of robes and lots of photographs I took during my field trip, field work uh, in Mansu. So they can uh, sort of use these emotions in the photos to recreate a map of their own. And there are some fictions also inside and some memories uh, of the past. And for example, on this, uh, on the right bottom side, this is like a map of different scale of winds that is uh, like ordered in like the fair of military and colonies. So the rightest one is like a temple and the first one is like more mil spikes of photos. And some are like uh, getting lost in the island. So it's, a, it's in this shape. And this is like a magnifier underneath this uh, direction thing. So it's actually not working. So it's like they are getting lost uh, in the tunnel. And there are uh, a lot of uh, contents and feelings in, in each map, map because we, we did it two times. So it's a lot of uh, things. And then I turned the, the things they said into a book because there are so many uh, stories they said that I, I feel a, a book is better to present all the text. Uh, so this is the first reason that I uh, decided to do an artist's book because I want to sort of share the, the details of the stories of what they say. And the second is because um, I want to sort of recreate the sense of touch in the exhibition because 
Uh, I personally really like stones, and I also think uh, spikes and stones. It's actually really about the textures of the island. So if um, I make video, people cannot touch, and it's sort of immaterial. Uh, so I want to to make a book that people can touch. Um, but usually, I think when people read a book, they are also not so aware of the texture so much because people, I mean, if you are reading a book that is mainly just uh, about text, then you sort of think that the paper is sort of transparent, you are focusing on the text. So I was thinking how I can make uh, people to focus more on the texture of the book. And also uh, I want to sort of represent the whole workshop or reconstruct the experience of the workshop to the readers that they didn't uh, went to Mazu before or they cannot attend the workshop. So I, I chose a, a few things to represent that. Uh, the first one is like, um, I, use a lot of close-ups of the textures of the stones because I think close-ups can make is a visual like a text uh, textile visual when you do close-up you can start to have a sensation of textures if you use a close-up so uh, the whole book are consists of close-up of the stone textures and the text about what the participants said during the workshop and I categorize the what they said like by feelings and things, and I also fragment them. And then I did a translation of all this uh, text into a braille for the blind. So this is a, a way to represent the blindfolded exercise in the workshop. So uh, of course, most people uh, cannot understand this braille blind but they can touch it. So it's like a translation of the blindfolded exercise when the participants were like touching the tunnels and touching their stones. So as the readers flip through the book, the time of flipping the book is also the time of walking through the tunnels. So in the middle, I insert this extreme close-up of the stone that I take uh, with uh, a magnifier. And then throughout this book, this stone become like smaller and smaller. Because I think if you've been to Mansoul, you will, I hope, like you will feel that uh, because when you walk in lots of tunnels, the feeling is like it's really dark. You have to use a light and usually the only light, not on artificial light, is at the end of the tunnel where there is a window or like, a, you know, the thing for shooting. I don't know how to say English, like a, a hole at the end. So this is also like representing the tunnels and the feeling of uh, working through the tunnels. So that's why this uh, I use it like a circle, like a tunnel, and then when you flip it, at the end of the book, this become completely uh, black. So um, the last thing I want to explain is why I sort of fragmented the text uh, of what the participants said that I don't want to uh, uh, present the whole like storylines in their own original, more logical way of telling stories because I sort of want to invite the readers who, who read this book can have more association and, and, and the feeling of inner floating memories and to, to show this aspect of dreams and, and, and memories. And it's a, it's a book about the collective affective consciousness of the locals and also the readers uh, in the exhibition. And because uh, uh, also, maybe I can explain a little bit that the, the texture of the stones, I use a more transparent paper so that my, my, my purpose was like people can see the burial for the blind and the texture of the stones at the same time 
with this light because lighting is you know like tunneled and it's also like you can see the texture of the stone and the paper more clearly and you can see the memories collaged with the braille for the blind at the same time so i used really transparent uh paper that the light can go through and as I, I've told you that uh, I'm sort of a nerd because I have an academic background. So when I design workshop, even if it's like the same activity or something, I, I was actually, I always read books uh, first when I designed. Although I was this time, I was trying to sort of put my body or, or emotion first. But when I start to design thing, I, I have to, to read the books again. And then, so uh, I want to explain a bit more about uh, my thinking process for design, although it might seem maybe I don't need the theory, but uh, the truth is that during the design process, uh, I have to read books because it's the most comfortable uh, medium that I've been trained. And also, and as told you, my, my training was more in European philosophy, so it's really strange. I think that most of the time I'm reading sort of Chinese translation from uh, French uh, philosophy. So, okay, so this, um, so so I'm going back a bit uh, at the beginning that, okay, after Tammy told me, well, we have to do some workshop in Mazu, I was like, okay, I cannot do surrealism because it's like, a, for old Eden sense, it's really not uh, making sense, and and but but I still need uh, to to some theory for this uh, workshop because that's my habit and background. And then I was thinking, okay, maybe I adapt some strategies from them, but choose a different context. And then I I found situationism, but it's of course a different context as well because uh, situationism they they use lots of surrealist uh, strategies and their purpose is for art intervention and they are interested in how art plays a role in intervening or transforming the society and so for example they also use collage tactic as a activity or they have these games that they're getting lost in a city with the wrong map like a way, it's a way for them to fight against the alienation of consumer society. So they believe that art can transform homogeneous urban space or a consumer uh, capital intensive space into heterogeneous creative places. I just take these same strategies but different ends because you know, Emma's is not so cons like the consumer society so much. I think they are a bit of tourist spot, but they are still pretty like natural and get along with the natural place. So, so I use the same strategy, but my aim is more focusing on the relationship between the local people and their memory and emotion of a landscape. So these strategies are sort of adapt to use more like a way to collect their memory, uh, memories and emotions. And I was driven by these questions that, so how to look at the landscape from the perspective of local memories and their authentic emotions from their body, instead of from the perspective from a tourist or an official history, because Myself, I, I'm a tourist in Mazu, and all I know about Mazu is about this military history, Cold War, and and like lots of people in Taiwan, they had a military service in Mazu. And before this project, that's all I know about Mazu, which is really sad. And and it's like a typical narrative of people official history and as tourists even if i'm from taiwan so i was thinking what really matters to local is actually really different from the possible world that uh we have to believe because they are living the here and now and although they are experiencing the outcome of the politics and power place every day but actually for local people usually uh, is their everyday life, their memories and well-being are, are more 
at the center. So uh, the point I want to make here is like uh, uh, there's a film made by Zhang Xianqi. It's called The World That Never Was that I really like. And, and in this film, the director asks his mom that, have you ever heard about the Cold War? And she didn't know the term. But her whole life was definitely drastically influenced by the Cold War. So also she showed a sense of politics during that documentary film. But it was really, really different from all the grand narrative of the Cold War that defined the official history. So if I make a point here that I want to say is that for me, this workshop, there's also another purpose that I want to find uh, another way to look at all this military landscape with the spikes and with the stones that we often just think is some kind of like really fair, fair of military or some kind of war that you think maybe it's dangerous to go, go there. But actually, for the local people, it's uh, quite different. They have so the, so many sentiments, and they grow up there. And it's uh, it's another meaning. It's not just military uh, landscape. It's not just spikes. It's uh, their whole life are growing there. So the last thing uh, I would like to uh, share is a little bit about my uh, personal context because. Uh, I have a background in academic, and I just started to be an artist a few years ago. So, so I was like trying to uh, want to sort of abandon the, like uh, my academic part a little bit. Um, so uh, it's like uh, I I chose uh, the name of the workshop. Punctum is also from Roland Barthes' uh, theory that uh, he defined like there are two ways to look at photographer. One is punctum is the name of the workshops. Uh, the other is studium. So studium is the one that I was more used to. It's about analyzing the culture denotations uh, of the photographs or the historical context of the photograph. And punctum uh, is about the uh, feeling or uh, how do you feel about the photographs? Like a photograph's punctum is that accident which picks me and bruises you. And in order to perceive the punctum, uh, you don't need analysis. So sort of for me, I'm also in this process of effective turn. And in Chinese, uh, we translate punctum as zi dian. And the first word, the first character is also spike uh, in Chinese. So uh, there is a sort of a word playing here as well. And uh, yeah, I really thank also for all the participants uh, in the workshop that can share all these lovely stories. And thanks to uh, Tammy for inviting. And also this is the first time I make an artist book and uh, Lucky and Xiaomu and they were like helping me a lot uh, during the design and the details of printing. And I also really thank Mocha because uh, I think uh, Mocha has always been the source, sources and access for me to contemporary art since I was really little. And uh, I was also working uh, for a while as a volunteer in Mocha when I was in college. So uh, it's uh, really meaningful for me to is with my uh, book here. So yeah, thank you for, for your listening. Thank you, Xiang Yun, and thank you, Emma. Um, so before there's questions from the audience, I would like to raise like comments a bit. I feel like from both of your presentation, there's, we can see different levels and of translation, how, of how, and this is something that actually um, correspond to the idea of you dream for others. Um, like Emma, you coming from the background of, of a friend, of friends, and then you, look, so your perspective to Taiwan and to Mount is definitely different. Whereas Xiaoyun, you're from Taiwan, it's also different from people in Mount. 
and also you and through the landscape uh through this the scope like Xiao Yun trying to interpret and transform the European theory and to mix it with the body sensation and with the local memory and um Emma is trying to translate with uh singing to to trespass the distance between her and the Matu people. So we see very different approaches, but also uh, that approaches is aiming to explore the more inner side of the place and the people. And um, I would also like to ask Emma, um, like for you, this is also the first time for you to do a work remotely. Um, how do you how do you come up with the idea? How do you use the uh, like what kind of resources or like what help you to form the idea when you cannot be there? Should I start now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was definitely a lot of first for mm -hmm. me. First, uh, first be first experience being um being with like doing a piece remotely. First experience um doing a show in Taiwan, first experience doing a show that that uh, has a, um, that is that is also a situation that is going on right now. Of course, there's like a, the history of Matsu, but um, we still don't know uh, what will the future be like there. So, so it's really, it's a really uh, a situation where I felt like I uh, had a really strong really important uh, responsibility. Um, so that's why it was really important for me that it would come from um, from the people from Matsu, that my lyrics or my perspective would come from my discussions with them. And um, and also with you, we've, we've talked a lot. So I knew, I knew a lot about Taiwan in the past. Um, because I'm interested in the uh, political situations in like international, um, in the world in general. So I knew about China and Taiwan, but I didn't know anything about Mat the Matsu Islands. So I read, I read articles. I read, um, I read a little more about um, China, uh, but mainly for the the. For the actual piece, it was really from our discussions and really from what they had to tell me. And also, at first, I thought, okay, um, there is a situation between the Matsuelans and China, but I didn't realize there was also a situation between the Matsuelans and the the um, the main island of uh, Taiwan, and that with the idea of protection that they were actually in a situation that was complicated. Um, so so I didn't know that. And that was from um, talking with Ms. Chang, who explained that uh, a little more to me. And uh, so I mainly found out from the people. And I, I think there's different um, ways to approach something that is so uh, present and political and, and historic um, that I could have read a lot about um, political books, but to me, it was more important to actually listen to what the people had to say. And that's why I asked them what were their questions. And and then I, I picked the questions that were, um, I picked three questions for each of them that were um, quite different from each, from each other. So it would have like a, we would have an idea of uh, different, uh, pers like different questions in general, and then I wrote the lyrics. So yeah, them first, and then, and then how do I, do, how do I react uh, to that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, I know that because both of you are in Europe right now, so. Unfortunately, you cannot be in the exhibition to see each other's work 
in person. But after uh, listening to each other's presentation, do you have any comments or any feedback that because you all have have a very different approaches and but in the same show, is there anything you would like to share or comment on? Well, I thought it was really interesting to uh, have an approach that was very uh, like uh, from the landscape and how and and how a political situation and a historical situation impacts everyone's daily lives and actually the landscape itself like like this is really uh, it, it really shows how everything is uh, intertwined and and how yeah we're codependent of a political situation in our daily lives so I thought that was really interesting to come from to talk about the the um, the, the rocks and and have like a very tactile situation. I think uh, I think a situation like this is very physical. So so that's that's great to use the you know the hands and to have a very uh, tactile thing approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like uh, I really like Emma's works as well. And I was wondering that because I think. Uh, the artworks Tammy chose for these exhibitions all have this poetic and dreamy aspect of the film in terms of uh, aesthetics. And I was wondering, because you're mentioning that you said your your works are poetic, but also there are always a little bit of a uh, politic behind it because, and at least I think, and in the appearance, most people will think sort of poetic is a bit a political and the more hardcore political art is like maybe documentary film or some kind of real subversion in the society. And I'm just wondering what's your perspective on this relationship between uh, poetic aspects and political aspects in your artworks? like the tension or you think it's not a question, it's not contra contradicted? Mm -hmm. Well, I've noticed that every time uh, there's some singing in my work is that um, it, it it feels like a very dreamlike. Um, so there's, there's an aspect of poetic, but uh, I use the word dreamlike more than poetic. Um, and one time for showing a museum, I it was the summer and it's a it's a museum that is quite famous. And I I I asked I showed them like I gave them propositions for the the show the group show during the summer. And every time they would say no, and they told me, well, you know, it's the summer, you shouldn't do this. It's too scary. It's too uh, too con confront like too uh, too frontal too. Uh, it's not. It's not going to be good if um, American uh, tourists are there. Uh, you don't want to do that. But okay, and I was like, okay, okay. And then I would. I, I suggest another one. And every time they would say, no, no, it's a summer. You know, you have to. And I was like, all right. And then in the end, I. It was exactly the same meaning in the piece, but I used some singing, and they were like, okay. And I was like, oh my god. You know, like if you, if you actually put some songs, then anything can be like. You can just do. You can just approach any anything that might be um, a little bit um, touchy. You know, like uh, that was in really interesting to me that uh, if that the musical aspect would actually ease things and you could actually uh, approach things more with with that in 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 that way. You know, I don't know if that's answering your question, but uh, yeah. Um, I guess singing to me, it uh, it helps you to get in the piece because it's a, uh, it's sort of like a call. And then when you're in in the piece, you're like, okay, this is actually something that is not just emotional, but it's 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 questioning things that are very, uh, very quite um, that are essential in in our lives, you know. Yeah. Thank you. I can't hear you. Tell me, you need to open the... Right, right, okay. So um, thank you for you both. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. And um, we are almost like 
uh, exceeding five minutes <laughs> of the whole time. So we have to say goodbye and uh, for today's sharing. But uh, this talk will be online and um, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person soon hmm. and to develop more works together. Yeah, that would be Any great. Any last comments? No. Okay. Well, so, if people have questions, they can they can send me their questions. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Questions are good. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that will be the end of today. And thanks for everyone who's watching. Bye bye. Bye.